All right. So thank you um, to Responsible Research in Business and Management for, for asking us to do this. Um, this is something that we're really both um, passionate about. Um, and we had the opportunity to write um, a tutorial and a book chapter on this topic. Um, but it's always better to just be able to talk to people about it. So thank you so much for, for coming and spending some time with us this morning on conducting field studies. Um, more broadly, I think what, what Ann and I feel pretty strongly about is just this idea of adding realism into experiments. Um, and so even though we're the, the webinar says field studies. We're going to talk about um, both field studies and then something that we've called experiments in the field. Um, and we'll talk about what, what the distinction between those is and how we can infuse realism into experiments um, in lots of different ways. Um, all right. So I know a lot of you are um, in marketing, but there's a big portion that's in management. Um, Ann and I are both consumer behavior researchers, um, so that's kind of our, our starting point and how we kind of view the world. So that's what, what really got this going is just the idea that we're in consumer behavior. Um, so like if we're studying a, in the field of consumer behavior, why aren't we actually looking at behavior right, more than hypothetical intentions and scenarios? Um, and so that's that's always been something that's that's really um, been near and dear to my heart. Even as a doctoral student, I was really interested in how people um, perceived grocery store displays in the grocery store um, and the way most people were doing um, research at the time um, at my institution. They were doing everything on the computer, but I was interested in how people reacted to physical displays. And so they had this uh, focus group room that was attached to the, to the computer room. And I actually like asked if I could run studies in the focus group room instead of on the computers. And I brought in real products because I wanted to see how people reacted to the displays as if they were in the store. Right? So my solution at the time, at least as a, as a grad student who was just trying to, to get a dissertation um, completed, I brought products into the lab instead of bringing students to the store, but that was kind of the start of, of one of the things that I think has, has been really important to me in my research program is just getting at this actual behavior that we're trying to study. So if I was interested in how people react to these grocery store displays, right, then, then showing people a picture of a grocery store wasn't as good as actually bringing them in and having them see displays of paper towels and displays of cans of soup and a bunch of towels, which I had for years and years to come after this. But since, since that was the behavior that I was interested in, right, that's, that's what I wanted, to, how I wanted to run the studies. And again, right, it's, it's consumer behavior, not imagine this hypothetical scenario, not would you intend to do it, it would be much closer to, to that specific phenomenon if we actually look at people engaging with the displays. So that was kind of the start to, to my um, excitement over, over running more realistic studies. Um, but more broadly, kind of one of the, the key propositions that, that we want to talk about is that if you get closer to, to whatever the behavior is that you want to examine, you're going to get deeper insight into that phenomenon. Um, on, did you want to, I mean, to add any? I'll just add my cynical view. Um, and I think that, you know, we focus on consumer behavior and consumer research, but everything we're going to say in this talk is true for behavioral science at large. And the idea is that if you are interested in studying behavior, study behavior. And if you're interested in studying behavior in certain conditions, try to study the behavior in those conditions. Now, we all know that sometimes it's difficult and, and, and hard, and so we simulate the behavior in um, different settings. We'll talk about that. But, but the, the focus, the starting point would be, the question is, how do I study the actual behavior I'm interested in? All right, next slide. Yeah, you have to say next slides, because I'm... I'm going to say it. <laughs> all right, so... Um, in, 
the JCR tutorial that we recommended as, as reading for this session, um, we kind of set up this framework for how can you add realism into experiments. And one of the things that we talk about is that there's there's two dimensions on which you can enhance the, the realism. So you can do it on the independent variables, right, or the dependent variables. And so we kind of, we broke it into these two different dimensions because you can heighten real, realism on both or either or neither, right? And that there's a lot of options available that it's not just, right, running a, a field study, right, with a company looking at actual purchases, right? That's one version, but that there's lots of different ways, right, to actually infuse realism into experiments. So in terms of the, the independent variables, we call this the experimental realism dimension. Um, and any, any study ranges from highly artificial, right, to very realistic. Um, and, and again, kind of as, as I was just mentioning before, the closer you can get to that actual consumer experience, right, the higher the realism. And some of these things can be really, really simple. So like I said, instead of, of showing pictures of a grocery store display, bring the actual products into the store, right? So that's going to enhance the realism, right? Of course, if, if you actually can send people to the store, right, that's going to be even higher because that's ex exactly the context maybe that you, that you are interested in studying. But it's a continuum, right? And anything that gets you closer to that realistic um, context is going to be higher on this dimension. On anything on the IVs? I think you want to you want to give. Ex I think that an example would be really helpful. So if you give the example of your uh, movie theater study. Um. Okay. So so I ran um a field study, and we'll talk about like what denotes a field study to an experiment in the field. Um, a few years back, where we were able to manipulate in the movie theater whether participants saw just the movie. Right, the movie with the usual previews that feature um, the upcoming films, or another condition we were able to add um, commercials, commercials, and then previews, and then the the movie theater. Um, and what was nice is we wanted to see the the main dependent measure there was just seeing how much people enjoyed watching the movie, right, and how much they enjoyed the overall experience. And so it was for that one, it was kind of crucial to, to actually have them in the movie theater, not just watching a two minute clip in a lab, right? But, but watching a full length feature film in the, the place that they actually do it to see, does watching the previews change it? Does watching the commercials change it, right? What we found is watching the commercials kind of contaminated the experience and made it less, less enjoyable, right? But but that part, so the, the movie watching experience was highly realistic, right? And people didn't know that we were manipulating whether they saw the, the commercials or the previews, right? But afterwards, we gave them your typical survey where they answered questions about how much they enjoyed their movie watching experience, right? So, so the actual, the independent variable is very high on realism, right? They went to the movie theater, they watched it, they had no idea there was a study happening. And so that piece of, of the experiment was completely realistic, right? Then when it, when it moved to more um, artificial is when we gave them the survey where they reported, you know, how they felt about their experience. But so that's an example where something's really high in realism on the, the independent variables and then much more stylized and, and um, less, less realistic in terms of the dependent measure, right? But um, I would still argue right, that, that that one counts as a field study because while people were experiencing, right, the, the movie watching experience, they had no idea that there was a study in pro progress. And so then afterwards for the dependent measures, they reported back on that very realistic, non-tainted experience, um, but uh, in, a, in a very stylized way. Oh, go back. We didn't talk about the dependent measures. <laughs> so that was the IVs. Then just like there's a deep, the continuum on the IVs, there's also a continuum um, for the dependent measures ranging from right hypothetical intentions. These are the classic 
studies that everyone runs in the lab um, and you know how likely are you to purchase it right versus actual behavior so looking at the actual purchases um, and kind of what what we put forth as whether it's a, a behavior is anything that carries some level of consequence um, so so we're very broad in what we think of as behavior um, and we would include things like um, physiological responses into behavior um, more so than than anything that's just circling a scale point um, or clicking on a scale point in a Qualtrics survey, right? Isn't real behavior, uh, but anything that has some sort of consequence for participants, um, we kind of put in this this behavior category. But again, it's a continuum, um, and so you can have right based on these two different dimensions: experimental realism and behavioral um, versus um, just measures. Right, then you get kind of different levels of realism on either of these dimensions. And you can think of them as, as quadrants. Um, so high, high, high and high, low and low, and then the mix in between. Let me just respond. There's a great question yeah. in the chat about the ethics of it. What do you mean you put people in an experiment, but they don't know they're in an experiment? Shouldn't there be consent? Shouldn't you let them know? So at least the way the IRB um, federal laws in the United States go, if uh, people are engaging with a company in the way which is you know, part of the company's way of doing business, then you do not need to ask consent um, and you do not need uh, to let them know they're an experiment. In fact, we're, we are always in an experiment one experiment or another or a thousand by all the companies we interact with, they're constantly doing A-B testing and improving what they do. That's how the business world works. So when you're doing an experiment, uh, a field experiment in Andrea's example with a movie theater, um, that's part of the, of, the, of the movie theater's way of doing business, uh, then, then you don't have to have consent from people uh, who came to watch the movie. You, of course, can't force them to do the survey and only people who have consented do the survey with the, with the DVs. Um, there, there's, um, I'll tell you about an example. We did an experiment with HP printers where, the, where we changed the format on the website. Um, there, there's no need to tell people, hey, listen, you're being, you know, you're being part of, you know, you, the data you, you know, of your clicks is gonna be part of a, of a scientific study um, that's HP's business, and um, you know you go through all all of that with their legal to see what you can and cannot do. Um, but uh, yeah, exactly. So if the um, the the behavior is conducted with a third party, and that's third party, that's their way of doing business, then you don't actually uh, need to. Um, if you think about it. Uh, you would have to destroy the realism in order to uh, um, to have the same level of consent that you have in a lab study, which which then would destroy the field experiment because the whole point of the field experiment is people don't know they're in an experiment; they, they're just going about their lives doing what they do. Um, so that's that's the way the IRB uh, works, um, and that's the logic of a field experiment. There's more questions on about. Yeah, so <laughs> again, so, so the data part is interesting. So you might need to, to have an IRB to get the data. That's between you, your university, and the company. Okay, so that, that, is, that is true in many cases. It depends on the type of data and, and, and things like that. But in terms of the of the people who engaged in, in the behavior in the field experiment, you, you don't have any contact with them uh, with respect to, to IRB. It's between you and the company. Only you know, sort of having data has IRB or, or uh, EDPR uh, consequences, which you need to take care of. And every institution is different about how that's handled. Um, the, the whole idea of a field experiment that we don't actually stop the people and say, hey, listen, you're in an experiment, so give us consent. 
the, you know, if, if someone's buying on Amazon, the, the whole idea is that they're essentially, they're clicking on an Amazon website, they're giving Amazon consent to their clicks, otherwise they wouldn't be there. And also, if you have questions, feel free to sort of pop on the video and say, hey, I have a question and talk to us because I might be missing some of the, some of the text that, that you guys are writing. Yeah, exactly. Um, hand up. Yes, hi. Uh, hi again. I'm so sorry to to um, have to say this. I really appreciate the interactive character of the session, Dr. Amir, but uh, for the sake of um, keeping the flow, would it be possible to let Dr. Morales speak and present at least, you know, the first 10 or 15 slides and then jump on to asking and answering questions? Would that be a possibility? No. <laughs> we, we decided that we wanted it to be more interactive with people yeah, asking questions. We, you know, we don't, we don't need to give this talk uh, for our sake. The, I think it's for the sake of the people listener, listening. And so we wanna, we wanna be able to address some questions, we'll push to the end. But I thought this ethical point is gonna haunt us again and again and again. So it was really good to clarify now. Okay, thank you, understood. Yeah, thanks, You're no welcome. problem. <laughs> and I saw there's another question in the chat about but right, doing, doing other studies prior to um, experiments, which I'm not sure if you mean field studies or others, but one of the, the other things that we're gonna talk about is every, every study in a paper doesn't have to be a field experiment, right? That, that we, at least like the, the two of us rarely start with a field experiment. You start with kind of trying to figure out, is this, does this happen? Does it happen in the lab? Does it happen on MTurk? Right, and get more of a proof of concept that your your ideas are um, holding up in kind of the, the artificial context, will they replicate in the field? Um, so we always do sort of a combination of, right, more like lab studies and then field studies or experiments in the field, but it's always, you know, it tends to be a combination, although sometimes you have some incredible opportunities with, with data. Um, but generally that's where you start. Okay. I see Vrinda has a question. Raise your hand. Yeah, hi. Um, are you able to see me, hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, so it was my question that I had asked you about the studies before, uh, prior to the field experiment. And uh, if you could direct uh, us to some kind of uh, literature or thesis or dissertation where this has been done, it'd be good to read. Thank you. Yeah, so you could look. Um, I have a recently published, pu published paper with Kristin Duke in Marketing Science. Sure. The paper has the field experiment first because that's what the editor wanted. But okay. then there, there's about 36 studies, mostly were done before. Uh, wow. And that okay. part, you know, we did, you know, some of them happen in review process, but right. the, 20 were done before, and that's in part how we con convinced HP that they should invest three months and about $40,000 in right. changing how, what, how they do stuff to run our field experiment. Lovely. That sounds so, so we good. Them, we actually send them the paper with the, with the lab studies right. to convince them that this might actually work. Wow. That's, that's so awesome to hear. If you could just share the uh, paper as well here on the chat, that'd be great. Well, I'll, I'll find the link, Andrea. Yeah, kind thank of you so much. Me. Sounds so interesting. <laughs> and did they actually do it? And did, did the results happen? I'm very curious to know. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> great. Thank you. Um, so, right, in kind of getting back to, you know, the, the idea of do you always just do a field study, right? This is kind of the, one of the key propositions to both our tutorial and the book chapter that we have is that you wanna answer your research question, right? Which, which students always get a little frustrated because when they ask for advice on the, the final exam, I said, answer the question that was asked. And in this case for research, it's answer the question you're asking. Right, but it's, it's, I think there's a lot of truth there, which is, right, every research question is different, right, and the goals of the research are different, 
Um, and so you need to find the best IVs and the best DVs and the best overall experiment that's going to answer the question that you're asking and meet the goals right, of your particular research question. Um, a lot of times um, there's a mismatch between right, what a paper sets out to do and then what they do in the empirical work. Right. Years ago, I, I remember I did, I was um, looking at, I was an associate editor on a paper and the front end was really interesting and they wanted to, to investigate this, this real behavior. And then all of the studies were just hypothetical, right, intentions to, to behave. And there was a complete mismatch between what they proposed they were studying and then what they studied in the empirics. Right. And so that's kind of the, the overarching proposition that that we suggest is making sure there's a match between what you set out to do and then what you do empirically. Right. And sometimes that does entail a field study. And sometimes sometimes lab studies would be sufficient, um, especially if you're if you're trying to test right, a psychological theory that doesn't necessarily have right, implications for how you change business practices then lab studies that are tightly controlled, that can, can control for everything um, and, and provide clear causal evidence, right? That's probably the best option, right? But if you're really interested in, in coming up with um, like a, a new business practice that changes something that managers are doing in the store, then you're probably gonna need to go beyond, right? Just lab, store, lab studies. I mean, I think that, yeah, the flip side of it is if, you know, imagine, think of yourselves when you're getting a paper to review and the authors say, they have a hypothesis that say, people do X in situation Y. And then there's a study that says, we gave people a scenario and, uh, and of X and, and they said they would do Y. So, that doesn't really test the hypothesis, right? Because the hypothesis is, it wasn't that people's theories are that they would do X in situation Y. The hypothesis was people do X in situation Y, right? So that's that's the mismatch that Andrea was, was referring to and, and that we're trying to, um, to circumvent. There's also, there's also the case where you see a bunch of studies where everything is super carefully controlled and, and they find something that is counterintuitive, but it's counterintuitive because you don't believe that it's true because it doesn't make sense to you because you've never seen it in life. And then you, you read the paper and say, oh, it only happens, it might only happen when you control for everything. In reality, you don't, and therefore, there, what, therefore you don't see it. And so you might get criticized by saying, look, this is, this is a nice uh, theoretical exercise that you, that you did, but it's not relevant. To, to reality, no one can do anything with it. Um, if your goal is to develop theory, that's one thing. But if your goal is to is to say, you know, here's what people should do, then that's not going to cut it, and you're going to have to add realism into your uh, into your paradigm. So we're going to talk about ways in which you could do that. All right. So. There's lots of different research methods to answer questions, right? So we've got field experiments, experiments in the field, lab experiments, quasi-experiments, natural experiments, as well as secondary or archival data, which we could get right from the field, which has been at least a, a growing trend within the marketing literature, is to have some, some additional data from the field that can support, at least um, in, a, in a correlational way, um, what what you're proposing but for this for this um webinar we're just going to focus on the first two field experiments and experiments in the field um all of these have a place in research right but um we're just going to focus on field experiments and then the second one experiments in the field um and we'll explain like what the distinction is and and when would one be more helpful than the other in answering your research question but again, it's always about what are the goals for your research, right? And then what can you do to answer the specific question that you're asking? Um, all right, so I think we yeah, need just, to- I mean, just, Okay, go ahead. In terms of, again, this is not a hierarchy, right? These are different methods. You know, Sometimes natural experiments are gonna be the most powerful thing to show something. 
of course, there the burden of proof is, is, is statistical and econometric to be able to show that it's really what you, know, what you claim it is. Um, but in this particular webinar, we're focusing on the first two. Uh, this doesn't mean that, again, that, that the others are any less. In fact, we have data that suggests that, that it's not the case. Um, but today we're focusing on these. All right, next slide. Okay, so we just wanted to talk about um, some, some of the field experiments that we've run and give some examples of it. We also broke field experiments into two categories because usually I think people's first association with a field study is one with a company like ON's HP field study. Um, so those, those exist, they're really impressive. They, they're quite compelling to add to papers. Um, but as we'll talk about in just a minute, you can also run your own field experiments um, and, and just on, on the college campus or in another store that, that you've coordinated. Um, but so we wanted to give some examples here of field studies that we've run. And again, in our view of things, like the most critical thing to determine whether it's a field study or an experiment in the field, right, is whether people know they're part of the study right, when the manipulation is occurring and when they're engaging in that real consumption behavior. Um, so, An, do you want to tell a little more about your HP yeah. one? So, I'll just say, um, Ador, Ador, I'm not sure pronouncing it right, Adora, Adora? Adora. Just, Adora. <laughs> Adora. Um, so, <laughs> the points that there's, there's, um, there, there's inequality, in, in resources and abilities uh, to or, or, or ease of, of accessing uh, field. Um, yes, but I'll tell you that um, every time when I was a junior faculty, every time I, uh, even a PhD student, I thought, oh, you know, these, these tenured professors at top universities have access to all these companies and stuff like that. Um, now, now being on the other side, it's not true. Um, I think that what, what you find is, what you see is that kind of ingenuity and personal uh, connections uh, often help bridge uh, what seems to be kind of an unbridgeable uh, gap in doing a field experiment. And as you'll see here, we will focus on several field experiments that are not what you think. For example, I'm going to talk about a field experiment I ran in our lab. Right, which which is which sounds counterintuitive, but but we'll talk about that. Um, this you know this HP. The reason I could send HP our our, our experiments that we did in the lab was that um, the, you know the husband of a colleague works at HP. So I said, hey, can you ask him to to do this to find the right person? Often it's really the the you know the, the friendships, personal connections, or you could call call a company and say, hey, I have something that. Um, that can make you a lot of money. Do you want to try? And I can tell you with this HP idea, uh, our, our lab experiments, we use stimuli from Domino's Pizza. And so I called Domino's. <laughs> I got to the head of, uh, of um, interactive marketing. And I said, hey, we have something that can make you millions of dollars. Do you want to work with us? And his response was, we got burned working with academia. We don't do this anymore. And I said, but wait. We, you can make a lot of money. And he said, we already know everything. And he disconnected. So, you know, I think that it's, you know, in these field experiments with companies, by the way, which are not low hanging fruit, and we'll talk about that. It's, it's really, if you try, keep trying, you might succeed. But we're gonna talk about a lot of, of other field types of field studies that are much more in your control, that are even doable as a PhD student um, that we recommend to give it to give it a try if you can um and and so so this hp um, oh wait hold on i do i do want to i also want to echo the resourcefulness piece like like i i would say kind of my approach to getting field data was kind of kind of scrappy and figuring out right what are the time effective ways to do it the creative ways and the low cost ways to do it Right at the time, I mean, ASU has a lot of resources, right? But we're a big state school and I didn't have the same budgets as some of my colleagues at private schools. Um, but what I had was a bookstore on campus that was really willing to work with me. 
And so I would take students from the lab and send them to the bookstore um, and was able to, to get more realistic data without increasing costs and without increasing the amount of time either. Um, and so there's ways to do it um, to get more realistic experiments without huge financial costs or time costs. And so that's kind of the end of our presentation. We have kind of tips and tricks. Um, and that's exactly what we focus on is that you don't have to have right the, the field study with HP in order to provide more compelling um, evidence um, in your papers. But all that being said, let's hear about this compelling HP. Yeah, but <laughs> Adora added, what about time tenure track? We'll talk, so if you wait for the next slide, we'll talk about a different type of field experiments, not with companies yeah. that I think that, that we think are exactly what, what, what you need to be thinking of. So I tell when, when my PhD students come and say, we need to do, do this field experiment with company, I'm like, good luck when you have a job and, and time and stuff like that and can take the risk. We'll talk about that. So again, with this HP, so we send them the paper and they say, oh, that's pretty cool. And they find where in their website they, they're willing to do this test. And this is in the supplies finder. That's where people look for toner or, um, or cartridges for their printers, which is the vast majority of their, of their businesses is selling the consumables. Um, and what, what our proposition was, was that if you change the buttons in terms, in case, in, instead of, of people saying, do I wanna buy this? Yes or no. And then how many do I need? Which are two questions to one question, which is how many would you like to buy? Right? It's exactly the same question. It's just one question as opposed to two because zero is an option. Remember, this is real people. They don't have to buy anything. In our experiments, we added a, a button that says nothing or zero or don't buy or whatever was the context. HP doesn't have to. They're, they're just saying, well, how many do you want to buy? One, two, or three in, in buttons, like buy one, buy two, buy three. Um, and theoretically, we, we know when we knew from our studies that that changes how the, the purchase process, how the, psycho the psychology of purchasing happens and increases the likelihood that somebody would buy. Um, and so uh, we thought, given the boundary conditions for the experiment, that in one product category, we would find a big effect and in another product category, maybe not. So we, we ran it on two product categories, on laser printers and on inkjets, uh, different populations, different buying per, uh, behaviors. Um, and they ran it for six weeks. We, by the way, had, because, you know, we had some experience, some bad experience in the past, we wrote the NDA such that we for sure can publish this data and we for sure can get this data. Um, we, we, even, we even suggested that we don't have to say HP. Uh, they say, we don't care. Um, the funny part was that their lawyers insisted that, that um, that everything that happens, you know, the most important thing is to sign that they have full control over everything within a year. And we're like, you know, this, this thing's gonna take three years to publish anyway, so whatever. So after that one year, the, the NDA actually expired, but we still honored the conditions um, in the NDA nonetheless. And, um, and found that, that in our treatment condition, purchases went up by about 12%. And that translates to about one and a half million dollars a year for HP, uh, which is quite substantial. And just so you know, for the, the two years before they made this change, they couldn't find anything that improved sales on that interface. So they were extremely happy, which may leave us the opportunity to do more expense with them in the future, <laughs> which, which is also uh, potentially important. <clears throat> but that's just so you know how, how long it took. It took more than a year from them agreeing to do a field experiment with us to the experiment actually running and getting the data. And, and they were really good about it. They used a third party to program everything and the third party to run the A-B test and all that stuff. It just takes so long, which is why I tell PhD students, these are not low hanging fruits. Don't hang your hat or dissertation on a field experiment with a company. Andrea? 
Yeah, so, so I have a couple examples of field studies that I also did with companies, but they're also much smaller companies and a much shorter time frame. Um, and so this is another suggestion in addition to just running your own and creating your own field study. It's also you could work with a smaller company and with a smaller timeline. So I have um, my, my TP field study um, in contrast to HP. TP is toilet paper. Um, I had a project with my former grad student who was really interested in aesthetics. And what he found is that even though people are attracted to more beautiful products, they're actually more hesitant to use them. Um, but it's, it's a little tricky to look at consumption of products over time in the lab. And so this was one of the, the perfect opportunities for field studies. And we did not only a toilet paper field study, but we did two um, paper napkin studies with the convenience store that's on the ASU campus as well. And what, what we did um, is we, we partnered. I actually um, asked my fitness studio manager, like, because I noticed like we needed what we needed was um, how many people are going into a business. We needed the, the overall end um, so that we could also control for that in looking at usage. And then they had a bathroom and I said, hey, can I switch the toilet paper in your bathroom for like two weeks where we do one that's more decorative and one that's more that's that's plain white? She's like, sure, that sounds great. I was like, we have evidence that shows the consumption is different. She's like, I don't care, do whatever you want. And so we we just got to change um, the, the toilet paper that was offered in this fitness studio. So one week it was more decorative, one week it was plain white. And then at the end, we just looked at how many rolls were left. And essentially what, what we found is people use half as much of the decorative toilet paper as the white. Um, and But what was nice is we could control because everyone has to sign in to go who goes into the fitness studio we also had like the total end to show that that wasn't different across the, the different weeks um but it's it was a field study with a company but because it was a smaller company right that that i knew the manager from just years of going to this this particular studio um and so i was able to get data really quickly that was even more compelling than what we had in the lab in the lab we had people consuming goldfish or using a napkin, right, in a five minute period. But this was, right, just their natural behavior. Do they use more of this when, when they're not more attuned to it in a lab environment? And we saw huge differences in usage. We did the same thing, as I mentioned, with the, the ASU convenience store. They um, had this like grab and go counter and they let us switch the, the napkins that were offered. So we had plain white versus more decorative. And we got the same thing. We ran it three different times, always showing people use about half as much of the more decorative paper products um, than the plain white ones. And so, so that one, especially coming back to kind of time and resources and financial constraints, those were, were very inexpensive field studies to run, but incredibly valuable right, in showing that the aesthetic makeup of these products has a huge impact on real consumption behavior. Um, and, but I think the, the key here is definitely working with, in this case, it wasn't a large corporation, right? It's, it's just knowing the, the key decision maker that can actually say, sure, let's change the napkins for two weeks, right? It's, it's relatively costless to them. I was the one that switched everything. Right. And so you take the burden of, of what they have to do and minimize it. And then they're they're willing to work with you. Um, I did a similar thing with a, a grocery store field study. It was my grad students actually had a connection. It was a friend of a friend owned a small grocery store in Chicago. Um, and they let us change the display for of the of one product. It was eggs. And so we were able to put just one out that was like crooked. Um, and see how many people bought that particular brand versus when it was fully stocked. And what we found is when there's just one carton left of eggs, like no one wants that one. Um, it's different, however, if it's paper towels, which is an ingestible, you get a really different effect. But again, it was just working with the owner of the store, let us change their display and then track real purchases. Um, and so again, not, not a huge time investment because both of these ran across about two weeks. So
Andrea? Um, have we lost Andrea? On, do you want to yeah. step in? <laughs> yeah, address some of the questions we chat for now. Um, it's a long question. Unique style of creativity workshop. Creativity more than. Would it be easier if I just asked a question? Because I think uh, spelling it out is just a bit more complicated. Yeah, it's, I mean, okay, go ahead, ask. Yeah, so um, what I'm just curious about is designing the, con like, how do you manage the control comparison to a field experiment? I mean, obviously, one, one thing is um, doing what you usually do and then after making an intervention, right? But then sometimes um, the novelty of the intervention itself could be a confound variable. Yeah. And so I'm I'm kind of struggling with that uh with managing that bit of design. Thank you. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, that comes often, many times. You know what we like to do? We'd like to change just one thing, and then you know split the sample or or change you know change the different versions, but have one version which is exactly the same as 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 before, so we can determine whether what we changed had an impact and in what way. But sometimes in the field, that's very hard to do. Sometimes making a change is going to impact everything. I'll give you an example. We just ran, I just published this paper. We just ran, uh, not, we ran a few years ago, it took a while, um, an intervention in um, cardiovascular rehabilitation center. We instituted a system that's AI driven based on um, some uh, psychographics that, that we measured with the startup, someone mentioned startups. Um, and the goal was to tell caregivers how to interact with the patients in a way that would increase adherence to treatment. So, um, and we measured this by, by them submitting insurance forms and we saw that in six months, there's an increase in 300% when you use the system. However, when you actually implement the system in the center, you can't have the same caregivers treating other patients not with the system because they're already, you know, it's already tainted, as you said. You know? yeah. So even the novelty kind of. So what we ended up doing is we ended up using a historical control group that's matched against, against this field intervention. Um, and we were able to convince reviewers that the historical control group is a good control because they had a very stable uh, trait. What I really wanted to do, by the way, is get real data from history and now in a different rehabilitation center in that hospital to do a different, different analysis. That would be even better. But they barely gave us the data that they did because it's a hospital. And so we had a, an historical control group. But yes, it, it is a problem with some types of experiments. You have to be creative and it's not exactly an experiment. But what you have to do is you have to convince the readers that, that there is a scientific test you can conduct to see whether that made an impact. Welcome back, Andrea. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I can't explain it. Thank you um, so much. All right, why don't we go forward to talk about like the field studies that you can create yourself as opposed to partnering with a company. Yeah, so that, that goes to uh, the question we had earlier about field experiments with companies are, are hard, they take a long time, and they're super risky, super, super risky. So when a patient says, you know, I think we need to test this in the field, or they come with an idea and you tell them, you know, you know, the, and to convince people, we have to show this that, it, that it's real. Um, one of the things that Andrea and I have done a lot, and since Andrea gave lots of examples, I'll give two examples, um, is create our own field experiment. So the salesperson study, um, we basically uh, hired research assistants to put t-shirts that we created from a new company that didn't exist and created a product for, for this company. And the whole cover story was this company is actually launching this new product. 
And we had these researchers who walk in the streets and ask people in deep, you know, what we wanted to test is what information people had about this new product. So we had them have scripts that they, that they used to give, to describe to people. And we measured whether people are willing to pay 50 cents to buy a, uh, a trial version of the product. In, in this particular case, because this is San Diego, this was an energy drink for surfers. So, uh, so that, that was, you know, we matched the context so that it's, it's, it's reasonable and realistic. And the company, you know, they, we created fantastic t-shirts and hats for the company. So people were convinced that these are real salespeople from the company. And uh, again, there were eight conditions. It wasn't a simple study, but we did everything such that um, we could measure whether people purchase the, the trial product for 50 cents, the energy drink. Um, after that, by the way, we asked them whether, to, whether they're willing to fill out a survey and gave them the, you know, the debrief and everything after the fact. But by the time they've decided whether they wanted the trial product or not, they still didn't know this was an experiment. They thought it was a real company addressing them. Um, and because every variable in this, in particular, the willingness to to, to do this and, and the data and everything was under our control. This wasn't too high of a fruit for a PhD student to, uh, to do. And, and, and then we had a field experiment, right? Later we sold real products to people online, but they knew they were an experiment. So those weren't field experiments, those were just behavioral experiments because we observed actual behavior, whether they purchased the products or not. This was in the field, in the context, realistic, and people, when they made the purchase decision, didn't know that this was an experiment. Um, and uh, because we didn't actually, um, the, I'll answer that question in a text in a minute, because uh, we didn't collect any identifying information, and because after the fact, we let people know this was an experiment, um, we, we, it was very easy to get IRB. We had no problem with that. Um, and, and this was easy to do. The second one, I think, talks to the, to the resourcefulness and creativity. We have a lab here at school um, where people, the two versions, one is undergrads take, uh, get course credit from doing some studies. The other one is a lab where you can sign up and get paid to do experiments. In one case, we changed the way the sign-up worked and observed whether at what times undergrads or people signed up for experiments. So even though this was sign up for a lab to do something unrelated, the, the change to the sign-up was real behavior for people who didn't know they were in experiments doing what they would do. Uh, normally in their lives, signing up for experiments. By the way, this was a cool experiment. They, they had to play video games for 15 minutes. So we had a lot of people who wanted to sign up, uh, which, which is important. Um, and, and we noticed that the, the change we've made actually changed the times people selected when they want to sign up for the lab, which is real behavior, right? They came and they, they actually participated in different times. So it's consequential. And that's without any company, without any kind of hoopla. Um, you take some normal behavior people do, if you can change something, uh, you, you've created your, your field, ex field experiment without um, many things, right? The alternative would have been to try to collaborate with Twitter of how they say stuff and say, where, when do people actually tweet and stuff like that, which was never going to happen, right? It was just not. But changing our, our, our lab sign up uh, sign was quite easy. Um, question, so the, the control, um, so the historical control I ended up using was from the same center, yes. Uh, that's the question to that. Um, okay, so we have a lot of things to say about the philosophy of science, uh, not so much in this talk though. Uh, there, are, there are these questions where we're very happy to, if you shoot us an email with a question, Andrea and I are very happy to respond and correspond or even hop on a Zoom at a later time. But in this, in this case, we're not going to take time to talk about 
you know, our philosophy of, of hypothesis generation, uh, with all due respect, it's a great question. It's just way too long to answer today. Yeah, I think we should go to the next one with experiments in the field. So this is this is something that that I started doing that's a little bit different, and and we've kind of dubbed this term or coined this term experiment in the field um, because it it does very much heighten um, the realism um, and it has a lot of value, but it there was never really a term for it, right? Because you tend to think field studies, lab studies. Well, there's something in between and that's running an experiment in a different place, right? And, and so this can be really um, helpful when like the realism of the experience is, is key. And so I did a lot of work on social influence and how people interact with products or people. Um, and it's a lot of stuff that they would say, like, I would never do that. Like I've, I've done a lot of work on um, disgust and physical contact. And if you tell people like, would you, would you pay more for a shirt that wasn't touched by anyone? They're like, well, that's ridiculous. But then when we actually ran the studies, we see huge differences in willingness to pay depending on whether people think a product has been touched by someone else. And so that was kind of the origin for, for running these studies was well, people just aren't right about their, their intuition about how they behave, or maybe for social desirability, they don't want to tell you, like, let's get them in the context where this actually occurs and see what happens. And so for a lot of these contagion studies, we ran them in the, the University of Alberta bookstore. We sent participants who came to the lab. We'd say, okay, for this, pro for this particular study, you're going to go across the street to the bookstore. Right. And we want you to try on this particular product. And then in the bookstore, we had a confederate, an RA working as a bookstore employee, right, who said, oh, that particular shirt, because they wore a lanyard that indicated they're the research participant. So our confederate saw them and said, can I help you? And they say, I'm looking for this particular shirt. And they said, OK, so in one condition, they pointed to it on the regular um, the regular rack in the bookstore. In another condition, they said, oh, that particular shirt's right inside the dressing room. And in another one, it was on the return rack of the dressing room. Um, and so they went and they tried on the shirt and then they went back to the lab and they answered questions about how much they liked the shirt and how much they were willing to pay for the shirt and whether, you know, their, their emotional responses to that, that um, shopping experience. Right? And so what we were able to show is there's like this nice stairwise decline when people find a shirt on the, the regular rack, it's high in the dressing room, um, or on the dressing room return rack, it's lower. And then inside the dressing room is the lowest because someone else has touched it more recently, right? But the point here is, is very much a, an experiment, right? But it was an experiment in the field, right? We so People knew they were part of an experiment. They had a particular task, right? They went to the lab that sent them to the bookstore, right? But there was still value in sending them to this very realistic experience, which then they came back and self-reported what they thought about it. Um, and we did a, a similar thing in, in with um, a running store where we wanted to see um, effects of social influence. So how do I feel about a particular pair of yoga pants when I see the really, really attractive employee wearing the same pair of yoga pants, right? That suddenly, like, I don't like the pants as much when I see someone else looking amazing in the pants. And you can't simulate that. You can't just think about, right? Imagine going to a running store and you try on pants and you see someone else wearing the pants. Like, instead of imagining these elaborate scenarios, put people in those scenarios, right? Uh, to see how they actually... I'll say Sorry, something what? about that. Yeah. Many times we study things that are interesting because people's theories about them are wrong, right? So, so in Andrea's case, it's possible that if you say, imagine watching, people will, will say, oh, that's not a problem. That's going to cause me to want these pants because they, they actually have the wrong theory, which is what, part of the reason why Andrea's study is so interesting is because they find the opposite, right? And so they couldn't have done it without actually putting people in the real situation even though it's it's a lab experiment, people knew they were in an experiment and they get got back to the lab, the experience itself was in the field. Yeah. And the 
the other piece is like, they don't always have to go somewhere far. Like we had a vending machine study that was outside the lab. And part of their task was to, to go and purchase a particular candy bar from this machine. What they didn't realize is, right, we rigged it so that the candy didn't release. And then we looked to see their likelihood of hitting, punching, and kicking, depending on whether they had seen a scarcity ad beforehand, right? But it was it was just right outside the lab that there was this other right um, um, behavior that we were interested in studying. And so um, I think that the big takeaway with experiments in the field is, is it easier to take that, that context or situation that you're interested in and bring it into the lab, right? Because sometimes like with, with grocery store displays, we own a, a set of industrial grocery store shelves in our lab and we can stock it and make it look like any grocery store. So we don't need to send people to the grocery store. But like Brent McFerrin, who's at Simon Fraser University, he ran a study looking at how people respond to different cues in a hotel room, right? And so it would be a lot harder to create that hotel room in the lab. Instead, they just sent people to the hotel and they, they saw what the, what the rooms looked like and then they answered the questions. And so that's kind of another way to think about it is, is which is easier to recreate Right, that context you're interested in or that experience inside the lab or just sending people, right, to, to actually do the experiment in the, the realistic setting. And so I've done, I do both, right? Sometimes I build stuff in the lab and sometimes I send people out, but it's always like, how, how can you, right, get that realistic experience for the consumers? Let's see. I can um, see there's a raised hand from my mid. Yeah, just wanted to check. Uh, th thanks, I think, Andrea, your work is interesting and uh, something for me to learn as well. I was just wondering that when you had sent the participants to the store and they, they were knew that uh, they are part of that experiment. And when the person said that it's on the shelf, these are visits on the return, uh, this thing, uh, rack and all. Uh, yeah. How do you ensure that they do not understand what is your real purpose? Because they may also think, okay, you are looking at this shelf versus this thing. Okay, is that something which is there? So how did you ensure that that uh, they do not understand the manipulation as such? So, I mean, we, we have a trained confederate there and then we make sure they know who the participant is, right? But you can't control one of the, the downsides of the experiments in the field. You can't control every aspect of it like you can in the lab. Because in some cases, when the participants go, there's a dozen other people shopping at the same time. But right in the lab, you can always make sure everything is clean and the same. In the field, when you send them, I mean, we can make sure they find the confederate who's, who's actually you know, helping us with the study, who can direct them to the right place, right? Mm -hmm. but, but you can't control whether you know, someone else can be like, I love that shirt, it looks amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's going to change their response, too. But that's also why if you can show your effects, even outside of these controlled environments, it's it's even more powerful um, support for your your hypothesis. Oh. So, I mean, you do everything you can to, to try and keep it similar. But like the whole idea of doing it in the field is there's these other variables that are, are shifting that are going to add some noise. Right. Right. And, and just wanted to check if uh, any such questions came from the reviewers, because I think reviewers also can be sometimes uh, asking such questions. So if there was any such question and how did you answer that particular aspect? Like how do you respond to the reviewers? Reviewers on this, this type of like, uh, because sometimes in experiments, we try to control everything, but the reviewers still point out uh, such things. So how do you deal with that? I mean, that's the reviewer's job, right? But I mean, I, I do think, the strongest response to that is that even in this situation with additional noise, we found our effect, uh -huh. right? And you assume like because of uh, randomization, right? That those quirky things that happened, happened, right? E evenly across um, conditions. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> yep. So this is kind of what we just said is like, which is easier to bring the realism into the lab or to, to take the actual participants into that realistic context, right? And that's kind of, but this is this is another type of, of way to enhance realism that I don't think is as utilized as it should be. Um, a lot of people think lab, field, 
and they don't think about, okay, well, I could just run, run an experiment in the field. Um, so, um, all right, another, next. Another, another easy example for that, Kathleen Voss and colleagues have a paper where they either ask people to fill a survey at the entrance to the mall or imagine at the exit to the mall. So before they've done shopping to after they've done shopping, right? So, so that manipulation is, is real. People went into the mall and they did some shopping and whatever they did, uh, of course it's in the field. So other things change as well. So you have to clean this up, but you can think of a lot of creative ways to find the manipulation in the field while people know they're in an experiment and they're answering a survey um, in the usual conditions. We had a discussion about sample size. I'm not gonna, if you want, um, but, but the idea of is experiments in the field are essentially lab experiments conducted in the field. Everything true for your lab experiments is gonna be true for here. And as Andrea mentioned, you should expect to have a little bit more noise because the conditions aren't as controlled. So you might want a slightly larger sample, but in general, it's the same kind of calculation. Andrea, tips. <laughs> yeah, so these are just some of the things that we've already covered when we talked about our field studies, but it's just very practical um, suggestions in trying to, to make field studies more likely to happen. And that's right, utilizing your, your own social networks and relationships. Like, you know, it, it was on, was it a student connection to HP or a student spouse, right? You have a friend of a friend. Yeah. Those types of things, like if, if someone knows someone, right, then, then it's a lot easier to get in and just start those conversations. Um, I'll, tell you this, I'll tell you this from yeah. the other side. Um, I, I work with a company called Fiverr. I have a position there. It makes it easy to be kind of an internal on the internal side. And, lots, and, I, and I always say, if you have good ideas for an experiment with Fiverr, please let me know and I'll try to get it through. And the first thing to note is that Fiverr is not going to spend money and time on something there just so you can publish a paper, right? They're, they're going to spend money and time on something they think the return on investment is going to be positive. And in fact, more positive than the things they already have in the queue to spend money and time. So, and I think that's, that's a representation for most companies. There's the extreme, someone mentioned startups. Some startups are willing to invest because if you publish a paper and their name is there, it helps them become known and, 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 and credible and things like that. But for most part, companies are, are resource constrained, just like us. And they want to spend their resources on stuff that, that is good for them, for their shareholders, for their customers, for whatever. Uh, five words, five E and double R's. Uh, and if we want to convince them that they should run a field experiment, we need to show them why the return on investment is going to be very positive, right? And sometimes what we ask of them is so, so small that any positive impact would be great. And impact, by the way, doesn't have to be money. It could be higher satisfaction from their customers, higher satisfaction from employees, right? There, there's, there, companies have lots of goals, but you need to align, what says align incentives here, align your goals and incentives with the company, and you'll have a much better success rate. Um, there's always lots of risks. As I said, don't hang your hat or dissertation or tenure on this one field experiment. Uh, a colleague of mine, Karsten Hansen, and I spent nine months planning uh, a very detailed field experiment with a company that owns thousands of car dealerships in the US with actually matching them and stuff like that. And the goal was to measure the ROI of social media, which is something very difficult to do. And they were gonna spend $100,000 to do this because they spend a lot more on, on social media. So they wanted, they were willing to spend this. After nine months, we're, as we had the meeting to, uh, to go to green light, we're gonna launch this and make this happen. Uh, um, private equity company moved in to buy this company that owns the car dealerships in a management and you know mergers and acquisition act m a and so everything we're like stop we're not doing anything someone's trying to buy us bye bye nine months down the drain 
right? Nine months. I'm not kidding. It's a lot of work. A lot of time, as you guys know, luckily we both were tenured and also we knew, so we didn't hang us. We were doing lots of other things as well, but it's so risky with these companies. We had cases where everything ran great and the lawyers came in and say, you know what? You can't publish this, right? A colleague that worked with Amazon on their gold you know, treasure box or whatever had a whole field study um, and Amazon lawyers came and said, nope can't publish this. We had cases where people ran a field experiment and when the company sent them the data, it was the wrong data. And when they went to the company and said, wait a minute, it's the wrong data. And they're like, oh, sorry, we didn't collect that. Right, so the whole work down the drain because they didn't collect the data you wanted. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of perils involved with doing stuff with companies, which is why we, highly emphasize that doing your own field experiment, if you can, and again, it doesn't require a lot of resources many times, it requires some creativity and resourcefulness and understanding what it is you really want to manipulate and what it is you really want to measure and find the naturalistic settings to, to run your study. But you know, I can sit and, and waste our time with a lot of horror stories of what happens when you, when you try to work with companies. Another key is to find the actual person who can give the green light and work with them. Otherwise, um, you know, you, you'll be lost in bureaucracy and, and, and decrease the chance that anything would happen. Someone mentioned startups and we said smaller companies. It's really easier to work with smaller companies and startups. They're much more eager. The problems there is they're, they're scatterbrained. They do lots of things, they're resource constrained. And that's where I would worry about getting the data because Sometimes they don't collect what you expect them to collect. Sometimes their database is in the wrong structure. And when they collect the data, they forgot to note which condition people were in. And so, you know, which, there's a lot of things. Let, that go let the slide on. I think the next slide, like it addresses exactly that issue, which is, right, when you're working on these field experiments with companies, right, maximize the researcher involvement and minimize the employee or company involvement. Right, like in in some a lot of the studies that I've done with um, actual companies, I'm the one that collects the data, right? And that so I don't have to worry about someone else not doing something, right? That if if you're able to to do a little more of the the heavy lifting, then it not only will like you you know that it's it's being done right, but it increases the odds that something doesn't go wrong also. Um, and so then, of course, like because of all of the, the other difficulties in working with companies, right, that's why we also have suggested, right, running a field experiment that looks at real sales, that looks at donation behavior or something else on your own, right, that you can do that on campus. Um, you can and you can make create your own situation that that checks all the boxes for a field experiment um, and simpler is better. Right, that that the eight conditions that on ran is is crazy, right? Good good for him that it worked, but like the if you can simplify the design down to fewer conditions, especially when you're trying to to collect the data on your own, it's gonna it's gonna um, be a lot more manageable. Um, and then yeah, go ahead. Just, this is just as of yesterday, we just ran a field experiment with a nonprofit. With their advertising on Facebook. So they agreed that we would pay, which was 400, no, it was $375 to run their advertising on Facebook for a week so we can change the ads based on again. And again, they agreed because we already had lab experiments that show this result. And we paid for this. So they were they were happy for us to pay for their advertising. We pre-registered two dependent measures. Um, the the you know the clicks and the and and the likes and and um, we only received one dependent measure from them <laughs> and we're trying to chase them now they don't have it Facebook didn't give it to them uh, it turns out that they after we had set everything up they made a change that caused them to not get it automatically luckily we have the one dv and it worked uh, so we're going to have to say we pre registered pre registered two dependent measures. Unfortunately, we only got one from Facebook and this is the result. 
So even with a small nonprofit where we are paying and we've said everything according to this, um, there's still stuff that can go wrong. So you should be really aware of it because you know some employee made some change that we didn't know about after we set things up. So uh, as much control as you can, as much involvement personally with this, uh, you will decrease the likelihood that things will go wrong. Yeah, and I think our last one here is, is that you can measure additional DVs even in a field study, right? You get, get consent and, and run an additional survey that could perhaps give you more insight into the underlying psychological process and not just that outcome that you're interested in, in observing in the field. Um, next slide is experiments in the field. Right, we, we've covered some of these, but the idea is, is to really partner right, with, with um, businesses or campus stores or environments that are close right, to wherever you have participants. So um, I found that, that working with the university bookstores has been really, really productive. Um, they are on a university campus and interested in being involved in um, academic research. And so they've been um, it, across multiple universities, they've been incredibly willing to work with us, like more so than, than I ever imagined. They give us shirts so that they can look like employees. They let us put it, tables inside, outside. They let us set up a new fitting room. Um, so you'd be surprised at, at how willing they are to work with you. Um, anyone that's closer to the university usually is just generally speaking more amenable to partnering um, with with researchers from the university. Um, the other suggestion is to use Confederates. Um, instead of hoping and, and trusting that the employees will do exactly what you've asked them to do, you can put an employee in there, right? Hire an RA to serve as the employee that's gonna be helping with the experiment. Um, we found that to be incredibly effective instead of trying to, to hope that the company's um, employees will do the, the work. Um, Adora, is your hand up? Yeah, no, just some oh. point on Oh, go ahead. We don't have a budget to hire some Confederate. What we've done is we've asked other PhD students to play the role of Confederates, and then we play the role of Confederates in their experiments. So you have someone who doesn't know what the, what the conditions are, which, which is what you want the Confederate, someone who doesn't know what the experiment's about. But we didn't have to pay them. We just did kind of, I'll, I'll help you if you help me. And that seemed to have worked quite well. We have a question. Hi there. Um, so I have two questions. Um, the first question is, it sounds like you guys, it sounds like there's been a lot of, there's a lot of perils. There's a lot of effort that goes into um, making your experiments incredibly real. Um, I'm wondering, how do you not burn out from all of this? How do you prevent yourself from burning out? Because it seems like you might, it might be easy to burn out on this on that journey. And then the second one is how do you use Zoom or do you have any tips for using Zoom for creating more realism in your experiments? Thank you. Yeah, so so for me, it's the exact opposite. Like I love running experiments and running realistic experiments. What burns me out and we're still kind of coming off the end of this is I don't like running hypothetical studies through Qualtrics. And that's what we had to do for two years during the pandemic. And that actually was a lot harder for me. And I kind of was like, do I even like my job anymore? And then the lab reopened and I'm getting to, to be creative about running studies again. And that's what kind of fuels me. Um, so so my, mine's kind of the opposite. Like, this is what I love and thinking through what's the creative way to get at this research question is something that I really love. And I think it's it's similar to like the people who have been really successful in the field, like they, they enjoy doing this. And, and if, if you, so, so that's like, I hope, I hope you can find something that, that you really enjoy doing because it's, that makes it easier. I mean, the headaches of course are annoying, and that's why I think we've we found just some like really simple ways to try and streamline that. Like once you like have established the relationship with certain partners, like our our university bookstore, then it, the headaches tend to be minimized because now they're they're willing to let us do everything in that that relationship that's set up, and so we don't have to deal with the headaches as much. 
Um, on, did you have um, a response? Uh, two things. One is, um, I think that we, we're in a job with very delayed gratification. If you're gonna get gratification from a paper published, you know, you have to wait a long time. You have to be a very patient person. To me, when, it, when an experiment works, and, and more so when a behavioral experiment works, we, uh, that, that gives us, you know, that, that gives, puts a smile on my face. I also, by the way, having experienced giving talks in critical audiences, um, the, the difference between saying, you know, we ran a hypothetical study and that's what we found and describing a realistic study and saying, this is what we found, the difference in the response of the audience is night and day. And so every time something like this works and something creative like this works, you know, I get the, the you know, I feel kind of the naughty smile of wait till they hear about this, which, which, you know, I think is, is, is really cool. Um, again, I'll just uh, emphasize, you should, you should do what you enjoy doing. Um, I have uh, friends who get the same uh, kind of adrenaline boost when a regression results come out positive, comes out positive, right? When, um, when the data they got from some website reveals a story that they're excited about. Um, this talk is about experiments and realistic experiments. And uh, it's not a coincidence that we're giving it because we love doing this kind of work. Yeah, I see something about like work-life conflicts, which which I think it's it's similar. Like when you love what you do, it's it's easier to not get burned out. And when you work with people you enjoy working with, that's also makes it fun, right? That that some of my best friends are my co-authors and I enjoy working with them and I enjoy coming up with, with ideas with them and that makes that makes it a lot better. So I think we've covered this takeaway and I think we're close on time. Um, so we've taken questions throughout. Feel free to shoot Andrea and I emails if you want uh, additional questions or follow-ups. Um, thank you very much for listening. This was fun to do. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, thank you. And again, you, let us know if you have additional questions. We're always happy to chat about it. <laughs>